Much love and respect. Thanks for tuning in once again. Appreciate you guys taking the time to do that. Pura vida, mi gente. Hope you guys are having a good day. Today we're going to get into a very interesting subject and place. We're going to be talking about the Tayos Cave System in Ecuador in the rainforest. We have mentioned this cave a lot in previous videos. I think we have even read some newspaper articles on it. A lot of interesting things when it comes to this cave. The people who have studied it, the people who took made an expedition to it, you're going to see, including an astronaut. And we're talking about one of the famous Apollo astronauts that walked on the moon, supposedly. <laughs> But either way, he was brought along in an expedition to this cave for some reason. It is also said that a lot of the artifacts that Father Crespi ended up with, a lot of those artifacts came out of this cave, the Tayos Cave and many other caves like it around the area, in the whole Amazon and Ecuador, and other parts of South America. There's a lot of history with this cave. There's a lot of archaeologists who have dedicated their life to studying this cave. They have videos and books about it. I just want to say, now it might start out slow, guys, this book, but you're going to see how interesting it gets. Pretty amazing information. It's incredible that nobody knows about this. Only a certain people. We're talking about many people, many scholars, letting you know that the mother civilization came out of here. America's the true old world. And today we're going to show more proof of that. But we're going to get into this book right here. It's called Tayo's Gold, The Archives of Atlantis by Stan Hall. A whole new author, a whole new book. Again, I told you guys I have a lot of books that I'm just sitting on. I've had this one for years too. I bought it on Google Books a while back and I've just been holding on to it. I forget I have Google Books. I have a couple there that I have to read to you guys. We're going to get into this one though. It says here in the introduction, we shall save it because there is no longer a site of the Book of Council. There was once the manuscript of it and it was written long ago. Great was its account and its description of when It was finished the birth of all heaven and earth. That's from the Maya book of the Popol Vuh. Remember my video on the creation of the world based on the Popol Vuh and also how it's very similar to the creation story in Genesis. Check out my video on that if you haven't. El Dorado, Atlantis, Inca gold, irresistible legends of treasure and wonders that for centuries have lured the imaginations and fortunes of kings and adventurers across oceans and continents only for their cries of Eureka to fade away and soon abandon dreams. Lost lands and treasures elude the unprepared. Those explorers, adventurers, and prospectors, secretive, sensitive, imaginative, distrustful, persistent, egoistic dreamers, drawn not by greed, but by an impulse to join in creation's revelations. The first revelation being that more fortunes are lost in the seeking than ever made in the finding. When force generates the desire for danger, rushing through their veins, without which the indolent and envious would have so little to scorn, what genetic trigger, what beckoning star draws them like lemons to risk life and limb pursuing treacherous and unreachable goals? 
Neither tears nor chains can hold them, or any threatening storm change the set of their sails. They perish alone and forgotten. Footprints and bones exposed on some foreign shore or jungle trail, beckoning brother adventurers to take that last aching step toward treasure beyond their wildest dreams. Ah, dreams, that word again. In your wildest imagination, you will never believe this story. Here we rediscover the above mentioned legends in a single geographic location, sleeping a beautiful silence in the green sea and sacred valleys of an Andean Amazonian wonderland where unguarded euphoria is rapidly replaced by brutal lessons in self-knowledge. Those brave hearts who chose to follow the Tayo's footprints and bones will advance only as far as the respect they show for those who have blazed the trail and return for which the genuine few are destined for a life-changing adventure. Not from the celluloid world of an Indiana Jones or James Bond, but from real experiences of real investigators in real situations. Here, reality reaches beyond dreams. And here's a picture that says Tayo's Cave Spectacular. We journey further back in time later, but begin in the period July to September 1969, when a brilliant Hungarian Argentinian investigator Juan Moritz announced his discovery in the eastern cordilleras of Ecuador of a vast subterranean world containing a metal library and other treasures deposited by a civilization lost to history. All right, you guys hear that? Metal library. Almost like supposedly where they got the Book of Mormon from. These gold written tablets. Metal, right? Gold. Three years passed before writer Eric von Daniken met with Moritz in Guayaquil, then globalized the story in Gold of the Gods. All right, so Eric von Daniken, he made a famous book off of that. He came to, you know, the Tayo's Cave, and then he wrote his book, Gold of the Gods. Of course, he went alien with it. That's what they did, you know, with all our history. Controversially, inferring he had been taken to the treasure cave. Oh, yeah, so he never went, actually. But he got the story from the people, so he wrote his book on it. The sensational first pages obscure important mention on page 53 that sources had informed him Moritz was not the original discoverer. Who cared? Readers preferred to dream to the reality. So who was this mysterious predecessor? We will name him soon. I read the book in 1974 and following a 16-hour meeting in Guayaquil, with Moritz in April 1975, began organizing for July 1977, later changed to July 1976. A major scientific expedition to the Tayos Caves in the province of Morona, Santiago, on the basis that if no treasure were found, at least science would benefit. And here's a image of a letter they wrote to Stanley Hall, uh, Juan Moritz, so Moritz mining proposal, it says here. A military junta was in power in 1976 when the British Ecuadorian Tayo's expedition, consisting of more than a hundred military and scientists from a dozen institutions with astronaut Professor Neil Armstrong as honorary president and participant. Do you guys hear? They did a whole military thing a lot of scientists, they even brought a so-called astronaut, the famous one, Neil Armstrong, right? The guy who supposedly walked on the moon. Why? Why would he go with them there? Is he an archaeologist now? And they need his expertise there. It's like another world, huh? They need an astronaut's expertise? Or is it something else? Did he know something? Did they know something about this place? And why are they bringing more than 100 military scientists? from different institutions. And how come they didn't tell us about this expedition ever, what they found in there? So they brought Neil Armstrong as honorary president and participant, arrived at the entrance to the Tayo's underworld. Within four weeks, almost unnoticed by the world media, all right? They didn't bring no media and all these famous people 
a treasure trove of scientists' results was realized, practically untouched by A. Moritz von Deineken controversy that had precluded any official search for the Moritz treasure. And that's I'm glad they brought that up, guys, because that's what I meant earlier, that all these original writers like von Deineken and all the, that had all these books, Chariots of the Gods, they always made it into an alien thing, so people don't take it seriously. This is from the indigenous people of South America. It's not about aliens. So now it became official in 1976 when this multidisciplinary expedition ended the scientists recommended the Tayos region be designated a national conservation area. Later, at a lecture in the British Council in Quito, one scientist declared that enough specimens had been collected to keep all the specialized laboratories of the world occupied for a hundred years okay they collected so much stuff they said it's gonna take a hundred years to go through all these things so what happened you know what that means guys that means they're still going through the things or they haven't gone through it it's locked up somewhere put away in some basement or dungeon some of these artifacts have leaked we've seen them on the internet but most of them probably locked away somewhere. Some felt they had participated in the expedition of the century where scientific integrity has survived a hurricane of controversy because of the alien stuff. But you guys understand how serious this was, right? Just want to emphasize that. Uh, continue here, it says, I was in London in October 1982 when Moritz requested I inform British mining companies about his gold concessions in southeast ecuador to him the true el dorado he sent by a special courier an ore sample that assayed at 364 grams ton and an estimated valuation of gold reserves in his nambilla hard rock concession of 10 billion us dollars ultimately a consortium was formed comprising placer mining company of canada San Francisco Mining Corporation of the USA and Burnett and Hallamshire of Britain to develop 60,000 hectares of the Nambilla, Hard Rock, and Yaquambi River alluvial deposits near Cumbaraza in Morona, Santiago. You guys hear that? All the gold, the true Gold Coast. But these are big business plans. The true El Dorado, they're saying. Other major concessions were promised to follow in due course. Unfortunately, news of the negotiations was prematurely disclosed to the media. And overnight, the number of illegal invaders increased from hundreds to thousands. In a single moment of eureka foria, Moritz's hopes of financing his historical work vanished. Ecuador has little tradition in mining and less in formulating laws that protect investors. In an ensuing legal battle, Nambilla was appropriated by a consortium consistent of a Canadian Ecuadorian mining consultancy, the Ecuadorian Institute of Mining, and ultimately Dine, the commercial division of the army. The battle for Nambilla was to continue for decades, the only beneficiaries being the many artisanal invaders who, with families to feed, preferred the sound of picks and shovels to arguments. Illegal mining at Nambilla was has produced hundreds of tons of 22 karat gold as well as deadly discharge into the Amazon basin of tons of mercury used in the amalgamation and extraction processes. All right, you hear what's going on? But do you see how much gold they've been taking out of here? At least they are doing my exploration work, Morris mouthed ruefully. The one thing that eventually works in Ecuador is the law. I will get Nambia back. His prophetic statement was finally ratified by high court judgment in 2005, 15 years after his death. In January 1983, from a hail of rocks thrown at intruders, that is, geologists from Morris Hydra-headed consortium, 56 random samples assayed an average of 31.4 grams ton. To place this in perspective, the dream discovery of any major mining company is mineralization of three to four grams ton. All right, so you see the difference is way more here. 
all right? 10 times more, 10 times more of what a mining company dreams of finding is right there with minimum reserves of 1 million troy ounces. Moritz dreams of wealth, discovery, and fame died from a lethal cocktail of gold fever and inexperience. Despite his boost of even better prospects and his 10 concession portfolio of 2,000 square kilometers stretching from Nambija southwards to the rich Quinara and Yangansa deposits near Vilcabamba, he was never to recover from the Nambija debacle. All right. Now, these names, again, this is all in South America. That's what we're talking about. South America, not any other place in the world. Nambilla. Given these legends and dreams of gold as background, we move on to Moritz's most important objective. The subterranean archives and treasure he claimed would dramatically change ideas on the origins of humanity and civilization. This is why... They brought Neil Armstrong, all these scientists, and they kept this secret, the media way, and they never told us about it because they would have rewrote history, their fake history. America's the true old world, I'm trying to tell you. After the 1976 Tayo's expedition, gathering enough information to pinpoint what might be the world's most valuable treasure involved me and decades of investigation, occasionally sparked by intuition, the result will inevitably generate criticism of why I did not report findings earlier. Surely with my experience as mentor and architect of the Tayo's expedition, plus 20 years contact with Ecuadorian authorities and key protagonists, early disclosure should have been my first duty. Fate decreed otherwise. Apart from the Nambija setback, there were five principal reasons for the delay. First, Time needed to gather enough historical knowledge to assess whether Moritz or some earlier protagonist was telling the truth about the treasure. Second, time to investigate how a vast metal library might exist on a continent where no vestige of an ancient script had ever been found. I dodged the hijack. So you see, they're like, how do we make sense out of this? So he's like, he didn't want to come out. He was going to look ridiculous. And also, he didn't know whether to trust the first guy that told him. Third, whether or not I had a right to unilaterally decide the discovery should be a disclosed to the authorities against the wishes of the person I had come to accept was the real discoverer and b develop as a world heritage project fourth time to develop an historical and mytho historical model that might conceivably accommodate the alleged discovery fifth the constant need to protect individuals and their families, as well as national and world patrimony. There is a time for everything. Projects possess inherent factors that cannot be rushed, peppered with setbacks, upheavals in government, speculation and paranoia surrounding the Moritz von Daniken debacle, time needed for reassessments, plus four years processing world heritage status add up to a long time in Ecuadorian politics, with committees frequently producing decisions and opinions of little consequence days or weeks later. My experience concurred with my discoverer friend and bade us thread carefully. There was a sensational discovery made in quite the wrong place, with no room for error, no president, an ever-present cloud of danger, and demanding standards free from any expectation of reward. All right, and here's another picture of them in the cave. You guys see the block work or possibly geopolymer or megalithic? <laughs> Do you guys see that though? All right. That's inside the cave, deep in. That's what they call the Tayos Cathedral. And Tino says, my contribution, structuring the planning, organizing, timing, and momentum of the 1976 scientific expedition had produced hard lessons and could never have taken place had a civilian government been in power. Whatever might be said of military dictatorships, inherent traditions of military honor and logistic efficiency favor large expeditions of a multidisciplinary nature. Later, in the 1990s, the frustrations of mobilizing a metal library project happened to occur when civilian governments were in office, contrasting markedly with the 1976 experience. 
it proved impossible to find a way through the problems that confronted us, and I can predict no change that would benefit the situation in the foreseeable future. One reason is that key elements of Ecuadorian society have little interest in pre-colonial history. After the deaths in the 1990s of the two key protagonists involved in the library enigma, I decided to proceed alone on the basis that a discovery of such magnitude must sooner or later generate global interest and in world heritage protection. All right. And that's why I'm also doing this, guys. Make sure you know, know about this. There's somebody out there who is just like these people. I know it. And they're an archaeologist and they're going to go out there and continue the work. Because doing something was better than doing nothing, as he says. By late 1992, I was becoming convinced about which of the protagonist's accounts seemed the more reliable. Considering both personalities, their volunteer information, individual interests, knowledge and actions, outside and inside the central question of the metal library. Morix, who I had known since 1975, died from respiratory heart failure on the 27th of February 1991, shortly before his 69th birthday due March 19th. His dreams of wealth and fame, his library, and his claims regarding an Andean Magyar origin of global civilization. You guys hear that? Magyar. We just read the book the other day, right? When they were talking about the Peruan, Sumerian, Peguan, Peguan languages, people of Southeast Asia. So with his death, he says, that dream, all that was gone forever. Somewhere in Buenos Aires is his real treasure and legacy, consistent of one of the most valuable private libraries on ancient history anywhere in the world. Note, retired Argentinian businessman Guillermo Aguirre, who contacted me for some information on the 1976 expedition, is preparing a biography of Dr. Julio Goyen Aguado, who died 1999, an Argentine cave and expert and student of Basque history. For many years, a close acquaintance of Morris and whom Aguirre believes was favored with a visit to the treasure cave in 1968. In 1998, with the two key protagonists now gone, how would it ever be possible for the metal library to see the light of day? In September 1993, I had initiated Project Tayuwa seeking world heritage status for the provinces of Morona, Santiago, and Zamora, Chinchipe, later to include the province of Loreta in northeastern Peru. All traditional Shuar, Ashuar, Aguaruna territory. That's the nations that were there. Shuar. The plan steamed from 1976 Tayo's expedition recommendations impelled by the intrusive activities of oil, gas, and forestry companies into the region. This ambitious project initially made spectacular advances, but faltered in January 1995, when five Peruvian warplanes crossed the Cordillera del Condor and bombed the Santiago military base near the cave of the Tayos. Oh, how convenient that they did that. You know, that was a setup. But that probably caused a little war. In an attempt to save Tayuwa, by then endorsed by the Shuar Ashuar Federation, key Ecuadorian scientific, cultural, military, and religious institutions, UNESCO, and UICN, the Ministry of Agriculture, with indicative support from the European Union, I proposed a Tayuwa Peace Park to resolve the border dispute based on the success of 24 similar border parks in Europe. Instead, there followed three years of political upheaval during which three successive Ecuadorian presidents were charged with corruption, one being jailed, the others fleeing abroad. Do you guys hear that? Man, corruption. My God, another one has just skedaddled. Mid-August 2005, carambas. Then came the final blow. In 1997, a letter soliciting European aid was lying on the desk of the sub-secretary of the National Development Agency. Konadi, awaiting signature to process 11 million euros for Tayuwa feasibility studies over a five-year period. Political upheaval frustrated the signing, followed by an unrelated scandal in Brussels 
that catalyzed the notorious block resignation of European commissioners. Tayuwa died like a beautiful princess awaiting a kiss of life from a prince who never came. Man, you know, as I read this, guys, it just makes me think that they did all that on purpose. They might say, oh, we might think it's some political thing. They want the oil and all this other stuff, but they might be doing all that in the news to hide what's really going on in the background. This guy was really trying to bring this place to the world, trying to make it a park, protect it. They would have done archaeological work where it would have became official, just like they do over there in the so-called old world of Egypt and all that, where everybody's involved and everything's all carefully done and, and funded. They didn't want that to happen here because they would have rewrote history. But that's what I'm saying. When I start read this and I see all these distractions, all this corruption, all these people, they obviously put in power there. So they create the problem. Then they come with their solution, another of their pets or pawns. Why I spend so much time and energy on the Dayos expedition, Tayuwa, and treasure projects may stretch reader imagination. It was in October 1991, seven months after Morris died, that I teamed up with the man I came to accept was the original source of the Metal Library story. The treasure, he assured me, was not located in the province of Morona, Santiago, as claimed by Moritz, nor anywhere near the cave of the Tayos, meaning birds, in the Rio Coangos. Coangos, or look, you remove the A, you get Congo. If you remove the A, guys, you get Congo, the Rio Congo, Coango, areas. But in distant location, he called the Caves of the Tayu, meaning, in short for, the Empire of Tai Suyu. Neither Juan Morris, nor Eric von Daniken, nor anyone else, he insisted, knew anything about the Tayu treasure that had not originated from him. His name was Petronio Jaramillo A. In the period October 1991 to February 1997, six years of political mayhem, Petronio and I worked on the Tayuwa and Metal Library projects, particularly a planned expedition of occupation by Ecuadorian and UNESCO authorities, a brave endeavor. Were the reader to ask me now whether I believe Juan Morris had found the treasure, I would have to answer no. And whether I believe the treasure exists, the answer would be yes. In addition, do I think Eric von Daniken was right to publish Morris' story? Well, the way he did it, no. But was he right to publish it globally? Today, I would have to say yes. We have a combined detective and adventure story. But what a story. Continuing to says the treasure project. Hope you guys enjoying so far the story. This is a pretty good introduction so far. Quito being a capital city, hosting foreign embassies and agencies made an ideal international office. We presented the Ministry of Foreign Relations and leading embassies with a proposal for an ambassador's committee to supervise the treasure project. Members of the committee would be counseled by a scientific committee responsible for physical occupation of the treasure and preparation of a feasibility study patronized by the Ecuadorian state and UNESCO and shared by a renowned figure. Our suggestion being astronaut Professor Neil Armstrong. By the time both committees were functioning, world heritage status for Tayuwa and the treasure areas would be in transit endorsed by relevant national and international organisms. Parallel with the seesaw frustrations of three presidential terms in the 1990s, in recognition of my 1976 expedition and related Tayuwa projects, I was made an honorary brother of the Shuar Federation and nominated for an Ecuadorian Blue Planet Award. I also collaborated on the translation of Pedro Durini's groundbreaking books Ecuador Universal and Ecuador Monumental, dealing with the architectural and monumental works of the Swiss Italian Dorini family in Central and South America during the 19th century, which played a key role in propelling Quito to world heritage status. Now that's interesting because did they really build those buildings or were they already there? These diversions offered a temporary and welcomed return to the interdisciplinary world of building and architecture that inspired my interest in history as a battle between builders and destroyers. 
the search for the truth about the caves of the Tayus and the empire of the Tayu was never an easy task. I survived hepatitis in Guayaquil, living on sardine biscuits and mineral water, slept in remote Hibarias, short dwellings, trekked weary kilometers through jungle and bone-shaking electrical storms, more than once facing physical danger. Since the 1976 expedition, I had been accused of removing treasure from the Tayus cave of the Rio Coangus, of being the first martyr to science fiction, of working for the British Secret Service and Freemasonry. Is there a difference? <laughs> oh, man. Even of usurping the work of Moritz. In effect, I left few pages of the little-known history of Taiwan Tinsuyu unturned, careful to distinguish between the ruling Huancas, Incas, Huancas, Incas, huh? Huancas, huh? Of Cusco and the Caras of Quito. The Caras, Cara, Carrion, Caras, Carib, Caras, Carrions. Come on, man. Caracatay. Cara means black. A vital distinction between the southern and northern regions, seldom acknowledged by historians. When revered Quitanian collector Dr. Antonio Carnio. Uccelli died in 1998. I tried, as, as promised him, to rescue as much of his huge collection of artifacts as possible. Some non-archaeological pieces were sold by the family, but thanks to a benefactor in Scotland, most of the collection is now on a 25-year loan to the Universidad San Francisco de Quito for purposes of creating a museum and digital educational program focusing on the formative cultures of the Americas recognized to have developed on the coast of Ecuador at the end of the last Ice Age, 8,000 B.C., okay? So now we got a little interesting image on this side. And look what it says right on the top, guys. It says, Priest King, Tan. Priest King, we can't make this up. So it says, Priest Kings, Titles of the Atlantis. Okay, and then it says here, Priest Kings, titles of the Old World, corresponding Old World civilization, meaning of the titles in both the Old and New Worlds. All right, now this is deep right here. So we got the people in Atlantis, right? <laughs> Apu is the same as Abu from the Old World, which is the Amorites, right? They are Apu. They were here. Look at all these nations they're about to show you. Akin or Aken. Egyptian Turco, right? Sun King. Number three, Amuru, Amuru, Amu, Amuru, Serpent King. Chiri Apache, Shri Apak, or Akkadians, Apache, Akkadians, great chief, huh? Now look at the correlation. We're doing some little philology again here. Hatun, remember Atlantis, think Americas, too, all right? Hatun, this is all from here. It's the same as Atun or Atum in Egypt, right? Great father. Kappa, same in the old world. Kappa, Mongol Tartar, son captain. So Chiri, Chi, Caesar, right? Sri, Sri is Caesar, Syrian. These are very interesting. You guys can see Dush, Shisela, or Dukes or Duque. Duke, Sumerian, baptismal lord. Now look at this, I-T, A-T, right? Uh, it's the same as the Kati, Kati or Hati, Kati, Kati or Hati, noble lord. Remember my video on the Kati, all right? It all comes together full circle. Then you got Inca or Huanca, Uno, then Mongol Tartar, first lord. Inti or Indi, Indostani. Indostani, Sun King, Karaguru, Kara, Guru, Kuru, Syrio Egyptian, Chanka or Khan, King, Kanka, Kanari or Kanari or Kanka, right? Khan, Priest King, Eskitu, Kananite, Serpent King, Kitu, same as the old world Kitu, which is Akkad, Eskitu. Then you got Maya, Ayad. Or Magi Ayar, Indo Magiyar, Mayar, Mayar, future video. It's all related. Malku, Malku, Syrian. 
manco or mango, mango, tartar, lawgiver. What does mango mean? Lawgiver. You see that? Comes from manco. Remember the first Inca emperor was manco capac or mango. He was a mongol, but a lawgiver, manco, mango, mango tartar. That's why I say dodge the hijack when you're talking about mongol. Nahual, natkal, indo napur, hmm, serpent priest. Nahualt, same, nahualt, mongol, serpent one. Ona, hunu, o anis, ilamite, first lord, ilamite. The ilamites are from Shem, a son of Shem. Ilam is a son of Shem. Puru hao, look at this, puru hao or pharaoh, puru hao, pharaoh, fire lord. Pirua or Pirua, Pir, Pir, Persian, Hurian. This is why I'll be telling you guys what Persians, what Sumerians, what Elamites. Remember, picture the true old world. Shuara or Suara, Swarash, Indostani. Urunina, Urunina, Assyrian. And again, Assyrian are from Ashur. Ashur is the son of Shem. So very interesting if you guys want to take a screenshot and again this was the corresponding priest king titles of atlantis and the old world that's why it's all the same i lived constantly with reservations about morris claim to have discovered the metal library treasure although sympathetic to his theory of american magyar prehistory and post diluvial diffusion of american peoples accepting this worthy of serious investigation Supportive friends told me more than once, as had Morris, the best story is in you. Yet I was afraid when the time came to mention part of the Taiyu treasure that outshone the metal library. Even they must conclude I was just another deluded adventurer. So he was afraid, remember, because this will rewrite history. He didn't want to look like the crazy guy talking about, no, the true old world is here. My calculated location. For the treasure had to be disclosed because there was simply nobody better informed to assist it and because the number of investigators resurrecting ghosts and speculations was increasing daily i owed it to juan morris and petronio jaramillo who had trusted me to my family and to those who had supported me through difficult times this story might have been written earlier and with adequate funding perhaps advanced more rapidly but it would have been premature like in a plausible historical scenario, certain to lead to confusion, argument, and abandonment. Alas, there can be no happy ending, rather the inevitable criticism of how I might have managed the project better. But let the criticism be constructive, and only from those with historical knowledge and experience of Ecuadorian affairs. Certain not only could they have done it better, but to have guaranteed the time, effort, and willingness to suffer its inherent agonies and frustrations. These are the criteria that determine who might cast the first stone. My role was investigation, discretion, patience, argument, trust, advice frequently rejected, finally focused on a disclosure impelled by the deaths of personalities who had failed to work together, yet both of whom I considered my friends. None of us was perfect, and however much readers might wish somebody else had written this story, well, its truth and sincerity is here. For them to consider alongside that of others. And it says here disclosure. In a letter of 17th January 2005, I advised the Ecuadorian ambassador in London of my calculated location of the Taiyu treasure and the launch of my website, www.goldlibrary.com. The following week, I informed the Ecuadorian press and an article was published by El Universo on 13th of March. These were actions taken to responsibly transfer information to the state of Ecuador and to safeguard the families of Petronio and myself. All right, all right. So we're going to continue to chapter one of this book. It says here, Juan Moritz Magyar, extraordinary. Imagine listening to the following before deciding to plan a credible scientific expedition into unexplored Amazon territory. Humanity has inhabited the billions of galaxies for billions of years and has visited the earth many times in the past, proof lies in a metal library hidden below the Andes in Ecuador. 
inscribed in the mother language of mankind, Magyar, the language of Atlantis. Here, on the equator, in the kingdom of Quitus, the true navel of global civilization from which the city of Quito gets its name, lies the answer to the lost history of mankind. Here, at the headwaters of the Solimos, the old Amazon River, Solimo, Solimon, the old Amazon River, were built the holy cities of the sun, the original Uru, Tosol, Limas, also preserved in names like Limasol, and the old name for Jerusalem, Uru Salim, okay? Major drop there, where in South America? Come on now, where's the true old world? It's not just me saying it. Juan Morris and Stan Hall in 1975. So that's the author and the guy who went through that expedition. From these ancient cities, destroyed within the last 100,000 years by interplanetary cataclysms, touch the hijack with the space stuff, the surviving peoples of Atlantis, the Kara Maya, Parians, Kara, Canari, or Canari, Eskitus, Sumers, the Sumers, Hunos, and others crossed the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans within the highway of the sun between the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn to reestablish civilization in the valleys of the Yangtze, the Indus, the Tigris, and Euphrates, the Nile, the Danube, and also the headwaters of the Amazon. All right, listen to what they're telling you. So they went from here, right? to all those other places. And he's saying reestablished like they were already there. But when we're talking about Atlantis and Antideluvian, that's before the so-called old world and Egypt and all that. So they can't say reestablished. This is the origin. The prehistory of South America is hardly known, but soon with the revelations of the metal library, the world's religions and ideologies will be shaken to their foundations. Present concepts about the origins of civilization will change dramatically. Never again will nation war against nation, nor any individual dare to bear an evil thought against his neighbor. All right? That's what would have happened if they would have showed us this library. They would have rewrote history, would have humbled everybody down, or made things a lot worse. These are not the thoughts of a madman, but an outstanding investigator of prehistory, scholar, linguist, philosopher, explorer, Magyar extraordinary, Juan Moritz. Morris believed that prehistory lacks global vision. The so-called New World of the Americas after the deluge was the mother continent of civilization. So where was Adam and his people at then? If it wasn't in America, huh? And it wasn't in any other part of the world, huh? But listen to what they're telling you. The mother continent of civilization, the true old world, okay? Can I get a mic drop? And that his culture was ancient Magyar. We went from here to over there. Seeing it in reverse, European cultures, he affirmed, appear suddenly, ready-made, without the indispensable logic of previous evolutionary development. They were transported from the Americas, where evolutionary antecedents are simple to identify. And this is what we've been learning all these years, that there's an actual story to everything here. To Everything has a creation story here. It's not just a legacy. It's not just inherited from the gods. And that's it. You can actually identify that here. The origin. Groups in various parts of the world survived the deluge. But those on the crest of the Andes were primarily responsible for the post-deluvian dispersion of knowledge and culture from America. Around 7500 BC, they arrived in lower Mesopotamia in boats of balsa wood found only in South America, okay? This is what they're finding over there. Remember, we got mummies that old over here in Peru and Chile. The Chinchorro mummies are that old, up to 7,500 BC. We've gone over the information. Again, he's seen it in reverse. What Mesopotamia? There's a Mesopotamia, if you guys don't know, in Argentina. This one right here. Do you see that? Look at this paradise, beautiful place between two major rivers too, Mesopotamia, the original. So they found boats of balsa wood, right? Which is an American thing. All the way over there, they're saying. 
in Ecuador today, place names like Shumir, Sumir, right? Sumeria, Sumid, right? Look at that. Same thing. Shumir, Sumir, or Summer, right? Shamar, Mosul, and an infinity of others found mainly in the province of Asue identified this region of South America as the mother country of the earliest Sumerians whose ancient language is also derived from Magyar. Come on now, guys. We just read a book the other day, right? Talking about the Sumerian, Peruvian, Peguan language family. Come on. This is a whole different book, a whole different author. It has nothing to do with weird philology, but he's letting us know. The Sumerians are from here. That's what I've been trying to tell you people. Where's the true old world? This is deep information here. He held that the Magyars of the Carpathian Mountains of Europe were of American origin, leaving the Andes they brought across the Atlantic Ocean idiomatic elements of the Magyar language and an accumulation of legends, traditions, and beliefs today in Ecuador. As in other parts of the American continent, indigenous peoples like the Cayapo, Hibaro, Shuar, Tchachi, Colorado, Saraguru, Salasaka, Saka, right? Saka, Isak, Saka, and others speak versions of the American Magyar tongue. Place names and dialects of Ecuador that have vanished through a culturalization or been eliminated by force, like the Canary of Asue, are numerous. The similarity between Magyar and Sumerian tongues cannot be attributed to coincidence. Apart from philological similarities, there are ethnographic, religious, artistic, and folkloric connections. At the end of the 8th century AD, a Magyar people called the Karas, come on now, the Karas, royal Scythians, come on, you see the full circle, who's the Scythian sons of Isaac? The royal Magyar, huh? Who speak the same language as the people in Ecuador. Scythians, there's actually a tribe there called the Sala Saka. So these royal Scythians or Karas emigrated from India across the Great Eastern Sea, the Sinus Magnus of Plotomy, to their solar motherland on the American continent. They were the same Karas who, according to late 18th century chronicler Padre Juan de Velasco, arrived that same century in the Bay of Caraques in the province of Manabi in Ecuador. Too little is known of this amazing man, Moritz, and because he wrote so little, that is how it will probably remain. Yet explorers have organized expeditions of a lifetime just to experience what he lived daily. Before critics identify him as mere adventurer, here's a list of specialists, investigators, apparently invisible to Western scholars, who responded to an inquiry about Quechua, Magyar connections in the Andes, sent to them by the Ecuadorian Ministry of Foreign Relations at the request of Moritz. The important works of these specialists in Magyar culture and history require long overdue consideration. Dr. Barna Koza, Melbourne, Australia, specialized in the cultures of Mesopotamia, Palestine, and Anatolia, Turkey, has verified and ratified the hypothesis of D. Juan Morris with respect to cultural diffusion from America, again, from America, and the American origin of the Magyars. Like, if you guys really look at it, you take away that G, you get Mayars, right? Maya, Mayars has issued publication for half a century, including paper concerning the discoveries of Juan Moritz. Dr. Laszlo Rimanovsky, NSW, Australia, member of scientific societies in Belgium, sumerologist specialized in the cultural interchange between America and Mesopotamia, has realized studies about the dynasties that ruled the ancient kingdom of Quitus, all right, Quitus, Quito, confirms the discoveries of Juan Morris, right? This is a guy who specialized in this, all right? Giula Centurme, NSW Australia, a friend of famous investigator Pataki Kalman, scientific intermediary between Kalman and Juan Moritz, compiling 50 years of work concerning the American origin of the Magyars into a book, the American origin. Come on, these are old world people. Alexander Sasoki. Schlossberg, 2, Austria, 
philologist specializing in the languages of the Caucasus, the Uros, Altai, etc. Since the discoveries of Juan Morris, he has dedicated himself exclusively to the pre-Columbian tongues of Ecuador and has confirmed Morris' version of the American origin of the Magyars and their cultural diffusion. Okay? Many people letting you know. Scholars, Dr. Tibor Barath, Montreal, Canada. For many years, professor of history and geography at the Sorbonne, Paris, recognized as a foremost investigator of Sumeria and Egyptian cultures. All right, these are people who have credentials and are considered scholarly. In his book on Mesopotamia cultures, he mentions the discoveries of Juan Morris as an important clarification of prehistory. Okay, Dr. Dennis Gurgley, Ontario, Canada, eminent linguist who for many years has traveled in Central and South America investigating the origin of the Magyars, he confirmed the hypothesis of Juan Moritz having arrived at similar conclusions after comparative studies of Magyar with the pre-Columbian languages of the Republic of Colombia. Come on now, they're speaking old world languages just like the other books said, all the old world languages are found in America. Don't know how many more books we gotta read for people to catch up and realize this is the true old world. Dr. Solosi S. Said, Germany, investigator specialized in the cultures of Central and South America and analyzer of their connections with Europe and the Near East. In a publication, he has ratified the discoveries of Juan Moritz with regard to cultural diffusion from the Americas. All right, more people. Laszlo Turmese, Hutt Valley, New Zealand, ex-member of the Hungarian Science Academy, investigating authority on the peoples of Malaysia and Polynesia. After revising the studies of Juan Morris, he has confirmed that the discovery opens the door to a complete revision of the history of the American continent. So all these studies that people have done right on this, and they never told us any of this, guys. Did you guys know any of these people? Any of these studies, they already have proved it. They never told us. They never changed the history books. They just kept us believing everything was on the other side of the world all these years. Elmer Hamane, Cleveland, Ohio, USA. Professor of history and geography. Investigator of pre-Columbian cultures and their relationship with the Magyars. Among other notables with whom Moritz corresponded were Dr. Gotz Tony of the Soborn Parish. Dr. Alfredo Tagliabue, professor of history and geography at the Universidad de la Plata, Argentina. Also, Dr. Alfredo Colicker, Frears, historian and president of the Universidad Argentina de Ciencias Sociales, Argentina. That many of these scholars are of Magyar background may be good and bad, but reputations are not risked without justification. Collectively, they know ancient Magyar history better than anyone, okay? Better than Pan-Africans. In September 1969, a media report on the July expedition of Moritz into the eastern cordilleras of the Andes rumbled like an earthquake across Central and South America. Chasing the aftershocks, writer Eric von Daniken visited him in Guayaquil in 1972. In Gold of the Gods, von Daniken describes a visit to the metal library and other treasures, inferring he had actually been there later claiming, after the 1976 Tayus expedition, that he had used author's license for dramatic effect. In fact, Moritz and Dr. Gerardo Peña Mateos had taken him on a two-day jeep trip from Guayaquil to Cuenca. He spent some hours in the museum of the Cathedral Maria Auxiliadora with legendary Salesian priest Padre Carlos Crespi, right? So he met Father Crespi, and he probably saw, you know, all his collection a pioneering cinematographer and revered missionary born in Italy, whose memorial statue stands in Cuenca as a loving tribute from the populace. There was only time for Moritz to take von Daniken to a small cave entrance some 30 minutes drive from the city. Gold of the Gods burst open an incredulous public in 1972-74. Stunned by what he considered a betrayal, Moritz commented, von Daniken has put my work back 10 years years you hear that so you see this guy and i know 
A lot of you guys who've been doing research for a lot of years, even before internet, know who this guy is. I had Von Daniken's books before there was internet. I had this book, Gold of the Gods, Chariots of the Gods. But you see the true colors of this person. He was probably an agent. He was sent there to take the credit and turn it into an alien thing so Juan Moritz's work can be ridiculed. Like he said himself, because of Von Daniken, he put his work back 10 years. And I would say that was probably on purpose. And all these people be quoting me, this guy Von Daniken and all these other alien fanatics like Brian Forrester. Yeah, I said it. On the 1st of July in 1976, a Boeing 727 of Ecuadorian Airlines touched down in Quito, heart of the ancient kingdom of Quitus, which had once stretched from the Pacific coast to the Amazon River Delta at Belen, onto the tarmac stepped 65 British soldiers and scientists, soon to join up with an equally large group of national and international scientists and Ecuadorian military personnel. Amid a public outcry over the secrecy surrounding the operation, the well-equipped force crossed the Andes into the steaming jungles of the eastern cordilleras, there to descend into the dark chambers of a stupendous Andean underworld. All right? This was what? Secret mission. They didn't even let the people know of the country what was going on. Why was this kept so secret? Something so big, so much organization from different agencies... And it didn't even make the news. Think about that. But then they find a monkey bone in Africa. And then that makes the news, right? And then you got this guy over there in Egypt. It's all sensationalism. Drawing the attention from here. That's a theme park over there. I've been telling you. The Tayus expedition had arrived. The honorary president of the expedition was to descend a six-inch wire ladder free hanging 65 meters into the dark interior and explore many kilometers of these Andean halls of Valhalla, accompanied by birds, bats, snakes, scorpions, tarantulas, and Russian underground torrents, at times up to his neck in ice-cold water. His name, Neil Alden Armstrong, the first man to step on the moon, okay? Why did they have an astronaut there? He was trained for it, huh? Or he's a high-degree mason who knew something. And we all know he's good at keeping secrets. Principal objectives were to map the cave system and establish a scientific framework for long-term investigation of the area. On this particular mission, there was neither intention nor hope of finding gold, archives, or other treasures. The entrance is located 800 meters above sea level, east of the long-disputed Cordillera del Condor, above the river Coangos. Upstream of its confluence with the Santiago, the local Shuar had been aware of the spectacular case for centuries, long before the Morris expedition in July 1969, which happened to coincide with the week Armstrong had stepped on the moon. Huh? So you guys see what's going on? Moritz is finding this world-changing, history-changing, incredible cave with so many artifacts, so many things that can rewrite history. But yet they drew our attention with the fake moon landing. On the 21st of July, 1969, Morris had signed a notarized document claiming legal rights over the metal library and other treasures. It is important to note the mention in this key document that his discovery was made in the province of Morona, Santiago. But how did this amazing story of Magyar's metal library and expedition begin? And on the next page, he has uh, this book here. It says here, Origen de los Indios del Nuevo Mundo, or Origin of the Indians of the New World, or the Occidental Indias, right? This is by Gregorio Garcia. And this is written in the 1500s, all right? The Chronicle of Father Gregorio Garcia. On a day in the late 16th century, all right, 1500s, aboard a galleon crossing to the New World, all right, a galleon, not a slave ship, renowned chronicler Padre Gregorio Garcia would have gazed wistfully back at the disappearing shore of his native Spain, unaware of how his comparisons of Amerindian and Euro-Asian peoples would impel Magyar scholars to unravel the golden thread of prehistory. Even less could he have imagined the impact that his register, a copy of which 
1729 second edition was discovered four centuries later in a secondhand bookshop in Buenos Aires by a brilliant Hungarian investigator would have on the quest for human origins. Was it surprising his writings were suppressed by a holy inquisition fresh from burning Giorgio Bruno and commencing the 30 year war against the Protestant rebellion in Europe? All right, they suppressed this. On the next page, we have this letter here written by Juan Moritz to Stanley Hall. It says, Dear Mr. Hall, from our recent discussions, you know that it is my intention to arrange for publication and worldwide distribution of the book Origen de los Indios del Nuevo Mundo, or Indias Occidentales, by famous historical chronicler Fray Gregorio Garcia of the Order of the Orden de Predicadores del Convento de Santo Domingo de Baeza, who was for some years living in Ecuador in the late 16th century. The book will be bilingual form, retaining the original Spanish. It is also my intention to publish in association with the book important evidence, which will establish the authenticity of its scholarly content. I hereby give you my personal authorization to arrange the contract for publication and worldwide distribution, which will be subject to my final agreement by myself. All right. They were planning to translate this book and bring it out to everybody. His Origin of the Indians of the New World and the West Indies, first published in Madrid in 1606, is a key element in our story because Garcia objectively identified similarities in names, language, and customs between peoples of the Old and New Worlds. All right, this is what you find in these primary sources from the so called conquistadors and explorers. This is what they were writing. Place an emphasis on an ancient Scythian, Esquitus, all right, Esquitus, Esquitus. Is Quito, Ecuador, and who knows Magyar nations? And remember, Scythian, sons of Isaac, Saxon. On reading the Garcia account, Morris was reassured about his own investigations, later acknowledging his debt to Garcia and other Spanish chroniclers of the period, including Pedro de Cieza de Leon, Fernando Montesinos, which we're going to get into his book, a lot of good information in that too and Padre Marco de Niza and Juan de Velasco, the last mentioned recognized as the father of Ecuadorian prehistory. Gregorio Garcia was for some years director of the apostolate of the Catholic Church in the Reino de los Quitus, or Quitus, Northern Territory of the Inca, or Juanca, Puno, Magyar, Empire of Tehuantinsuyu, Land of the Four Quarters. This is what I was saying earlier about this word, and Tiwanak, and Tiwanaco, or the four sons of Anak, Tiwanak, four quarters, four sons, the giant, yeah, future video. So, land of the four quarters of Kutinsuyu, Antisuyu, Chinchasuyu, and Koyasuyu, stretching from Chile to southern Colombia. Ecclesiastical chroniclers have been accused of over romanticizing historical records. But why would such a learned scholar risk his life and reputation concocting a fantasy on such a scale unless convinced by the evidence? Given the religious bigotry and censorship of the age, his book was silently neglected. And today a copy is rare find, all right? They suppressed his book. Fortunately, Moritz found one. Stifling a cry of Eureka, he began correlating the work of Garcia with his own and other Magyar scholars. The story of Juan Moritz in Ecuador really begins in 1964 when he arrived with letters of introduction from prominent Argentinians addressed to Ecuadorian counterparts. In Guayaquil, he teamed up with lawyer Dr. Gerardo Peña Mateos, who was to become his lifetime legal advisor and associate. Invited to a meeting with historian Dr. Jorge Salvador Lara and other personalities with wide cultural interests, he was asked why he had come to Ecuador. The reply stunned his audience into embarrassed disbelief, all right? So he told them, I have come to find a subterranean world under your country that extends from Venezuela down to Chile and Argentina. A subterranean world. Listen to that. And that's why they were laughing at him. And they was like, what? What are you talking about? Unmoved by their reaction, Morris set off across the Andes, descending the eastern cordilleras by way of the village of Limon in Danza, in the province of Morona, Santiago. With provisions and hired mules, his guide Perez led him deep into hostile territory, 
Over the following years, he and Perez, a former army sergeant, became close friends. What happened on their journey remained a mystery until, after four years of investigations, Moritz met up in Guayaquil with Argentinian-born reporter Jorge Blink of El Telegrafo, who published the most fantastic claims ever made by an explorer. The subterranean world exists, and inside its chambers I have found objects and records of great cultural and historical importance for mankind. Morris, it seemed, had completed his mission, his own personal journey to the center of the earth. Gathering his thoughts, he turned to the task of organizing an official occupation of the discovery. Had he really found such an astounding treasure? At that time, clauses 665 and 666 of the civil code, you see that? Stated that the value of any treasure discovered by a private party be shared equally between the discoverer and the state. You see that? Civil code 666. Give me half your money. Moritz, no ordinary discoverer, argued that his special discovery merited special conditions. Inevitably, his proposals were rejected, which led to a quagmire of frustration and distrust. The project stagnated for three years until globalizing gold of the gods, until Von Daniken stole his story to make himself famous and rich and a bestseller, right, to sell his book. The most significant statement in his notarized document of July 1969 is, I have discovered in the eastern region, in the province of Morona, Santiago, within the borders of the Republic of Ecuador, precious objects of great cultural value for humanity. The objects discovered by me have the following characteristics which I have been able to confirm personally. 1. Stone and metal objects of various sizes, shapes and colors. 2. Metal plates engraved with ideographic signs and writing. A veritable metal library which contains a chronological account of the history of humanity, the origin of man on earth, and the scientific knowledge of vanished civilization all right do you see that that's what he wrote note the province stated is morona santiago how much of his statement is true and how much might be attributed to information from another source is a subject of examination in this book those who knew and understood moritz could never imagine him wandering off into the forest on some whimsical adventure a logical and practical individual each step he took was backed by wide cultural knowledge and his superb intellect. In truth, one of the discoveries of South America was Morris himself. Unfortunately, typical of pioneering investigators, he was distrustful and unrealistic in business affairs and vulnerable to the intrigues of concession invaders and government agencies. Captured in the seductive magic and mystery of Ecuador, his dreams of wealth and fame were doomed. A complex individual, he was mostly correct in his decisions and assessments, yet almost impossible to deal with, perhaps because he was too idealistic and wary. His historical knowledge may have been second to none, but his account of the Tayo's treasure had a vital flaw. Invariably, overlooked by the overawed consistently, he affirmed he was not the first person to discover the treasure and that, as confirmed in his document, he had found it in fortuous circumstances. Understand, Morris said tellingly, I personally have discovered nothing, but I cannot afford a single error and will not be pressured. Ecuador has been the most hostile to me of all the countries in South America. I stay here because after 30 years of investigation, I have found what I have been looking for, and I will remain here, whatever the danger, until I am finished. Since I do not work for personal gain, it would be unethical for me to expect reward or encourage sensationalism, all right? That's that same sensationalism I was talking about, Egypt over there. Thus spoke Morris on the day I criticized him for struggling to find his next meal, whilst Enric von Daniken was laughing all the way to the bank with his story, or what I thought was his story. Whatever may be the claims of Morris about a Tayo's treasure, his work on the origins of civilization and language justified attention without the need for a treasure story. Von Daniken is not important, he retorted. The truth is, I feel sorry for him. To destroy the greatest story of all time, he must have had some kind of breakdown. 
Someday I will build a rest home for him in the Andes where he can spend his remaining days contemplating his crime. I cannot always guarantee the reader the exact words of Morris' statement, but from many years of personal acquaintance, I feel qualified to present fair and credible reports of the man and his thinking, which I am confident would be endorsed by the one person who knew him best of all and whom I consider to be the unsung hero of the Morris story. Dr. Gerardo Peña Mateos. It is impossible to separate discussion on Morris and the Meadow Library from a vision of global history. Establishing some historical probability for the existence of the library is just as important as any search for it. Let us, for example, examine for a moment a similar story. All right, guys, so that was chapter one. So we read the introduction, we read chapter one. Chapter two is very interesting. When he's talking about a similar story, he's actually talking about the gold tablets they found, right, in New York, which they created their Mormon religion out of. That's chapter two. So so we got another part coming. We're going to definitely try to read the whole book. It's very, very good information. I hope you guys enjoyed it. This is deep information. We're making a lot of connections. We're proving more and more America's a true old world. We're seeing how they suppress all this information. They never told us any of this. These are things that would have rewrote history or his story. I personally think it's amazing information. Again, I've had this book for so long and I hadn't read it until I recorded it for you guys uh, today. So I'm reading along with you guys and I'm just in amazement. It's corroborating with all the other books we got on South America and all the hidden temples and cities in the jungle where they found all these legends of underground cities and tunnels and caves. We got the kingdom of the Kitus, right? Kitus, S. Kitus. That's the Scythians. Wow. Sons of Isaac. Okay. I'm just going to read this before we leave again, right? Again, he's saying this metal library is inscribed in the mother language of mankind. The language of Atlantis here on the equator in the kingdom of Quito, the true navel of global civilization from which the city of Quito gets its name, lies the answer to the lost history of mankind. Here at the headwaters of the Solimos, the old Amazon River were built the holy cities of the sun, the original Urut Solimas also preserved in names like Limassol and the old name for Jerusalem, Uru Salim. All right. Hope you guys enjoyed this first part. Thanks for sticking around hearing me read again. Much love and respect. Pura vida, mi gente. Awah!